Hello everyone, we're live here at the IPPE in Atlanta, Georgia. We're at the Avigen booth speaking with Bill Stanley, Avigen's Director of Global Health Monitoring. Mr. Stanley, please tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, thanks David. I've been with Avigen for about 18 years now, working as a veterinarian, and currently I'm serving in the R&D department, and I work closely with our laboratories around the world and troubleshoot issues in various places where we have operations. All right. Um, I know that um, poultry health and biosecurity are the highest importance for Avigen. Can you explain what the compartmentalization program is and how it works? Sure. Compartmentalization is a concept that was proposed by the World Organization of Animal Health several years ago. And it's a, it's a way to trade internationally animals. And we've taken that concept and applied it to what we do every day, which is biosecurity. And it allows us to uh, demonstrate to government officials around the world that we have a, a safe product to export every day, even in the case of an exotic disease like avian influenza. All right. And um, tell us a little bit more about why compartmentalization is important to the poultry industry as a whole. It's important because diseases such as avian influenza or exotic Newcastle disease are here to stay. I mean, we know that these viruses can change over time and we have to prepare ourselves as an industry for this inevitable fact to, to happen. And, and, uh, because one of the things that happens when, when new outbreaks occur is we get restrictions on international trade. So compartmentalization allows us to continue to trade for those countries that recognize it, even in the, the face of an exotic disease like avian influenza. Um, can you also tell me a little bit about uh, Avigen's compartmentalization certification? Sure. We have now our two main divisions, which are uh, in the U.S. and in the United Kingdom, that have been officially recognized as compartments by the government authorities that are in charge of this. Uh, the U.S. was recognized in October of 2017, and the U.K. was recognized in April of 2011. And we also have our operations in India that were recognized as a compartment. So for us, this is fantastic news, and we're really excited about what it means for us, but also for our customers, because we can ensure supply to them and to the food chain. Right. Um, how many countries recognize it, and what can be done to encourage other uh, countries to recognize it? Uh, currently, we have a number of countries that have recognized compartmentalization. And by recognized, I mean that they have the requirements written into their import conditions or their health certificates. So uh, some of the more important countries, I mean, they're all important, but some of the ones that we have are, include Japan, New Zealand, South Africa, and these are countries that have recognized the UK compartment and really that's just because we've had it in place a little bit longer than the U.S., but we expect the U.S. compartment also to be recognized by many countries around the world soon. And uh, what happens if there is, like, say, an AI outbreak in a particular country or region, and how does, how does a compartment work? That's a great question. When, when there are outbreaks of exotic diseases, normally what happens, or what's happened in the past, is governments recognize geographical descriptions of, of a country and that could be a the entire country itself or a region or a zone within the country <clears throat> and and then if you have a facility or facilities within that country or the region well you get restricted in terms of trade along with everyone else so the importance of compartmentalization is that it allows the government officials to distinguish the compartment from the, the rest of the country or the region. So high-level genetics, like from primary breeders, can still move internationally and government officials can say, okay, this can come in, but we're not going to allow a lower level of biosecurity uh, commodity or, or trade uh, product, something like, I don't know, broiler hatching eggs or something like that. So the low biosecurity is is not a problem, it's just a difference between what we do every day, which is a very high level of biosecurity. All right, and um, could you tell us a little bit about what uh, the current AI situation is and what do you think is the outlook? The current AI situation, thankfully, is a little quieter this year than it was this time last year. There have been fewer cases in Europe and the United States, 
and long may that last. The, the situation in other parts of the world is, is not as good. In parts of Asia still there's, there's a, uh, a concern of avian influenza uh, and other places as well. But overall this year compared to last year it's quieter. Really? And I'd say the outlook is, it's hard to say, but, but we know that these viruses are continuing to circulate in the wild bird population and we have to keep a close watch on them. Thank you very much. This has been all uh, valuable information, and uh, thank you very much for speaking with us this morning. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.